So welcome everyone to uh, this event uh, by organized by Mott's Climate Collective. I'm joined by Paula Tavera, Susan Shipley, um, and for this session, uh, Jonas Stahl and Rada D'Souza, where we'll be talking about the Court for Intergenerational C Climate Crimes, a project of Jonas and Rada's. Uh, given the ongoingness of climate destroying ecocide uh, within the framework of racial and colonial capitalism, who are the perpetrators and how can they be held accountable? How can the construction of performative and speculative juridical political processes of climate justice participate in the building of momentum toward large scale social transition necessary to avoid the worst of environmental breakdown? Targeting various transnational corporations based in the Netherlands, including the weapons manufacturer Airbus, uh, the fossil fuel and extractive financier ING, the polluting industry Unilever, and the complicity of the Dutch state in perpetrating intergenerational climate crimes. Professor of international law Rada D'Souza and artist Jonas Stahl have created the court for intergenerational climate crimes, including citizen juries and a more than human tribunal assembling an ecology of extinct animals, plants, and ammonite fossils. Conceived as both witnesses and ecosystem comrades, the court held between September 2021 and January 2022 at Framer Framed, uh, the platform for contemporary art, visual culture, and critical theory and practice in Amsterdam. For our current uh, November event, uh, we're joined by um, Rada de Souza and Jonas Stahl to discuss this CICC project and key related subjects, including uh, the role of human and more than human witness testimony, the conflicted geopolitics of the rights of nature under late liberalism, and the radical political possibilities and challenges of people's tribunals in advance in advancing social transformation, as much as the post-anthropocentric transformation of the social. So let me briefly introduce uh, our guests today. Uh, we have Rada D'Souza, who's a professor of international law, development, and conflict studies at the University of Westminster in the UK. Uh, D'Souza works as a writer, critic, and commentator. And she's a social justice activist and has worked with labor movements and democratic rights movements in her home country of India as an organizer and activist lawyer. She's the author of What's Wrong with Rights uh, from Pluto Press in 2018, a critical analysis of neoliberal legal institutions. Jonas Stahl is a Dutch visual artist whose work explores the relationship between art, propaganda, and democracy. His work manifests itself internationally in the form of interventions in public space, exhibitions, lectures, and publications. Um, he completed his PhD research on contemporary propaganda art at Leiden University in the Netherlands, and his most recent book project uh, is called Propaganda Art in the 21st Century from MIT Press in 2019. So we thought we would begin with a short video that uh, opens up um, uh, the discussion of the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes. It's a video study that, uh, that was recently just put together. And I have a brief description of it um, that uh, explains that D'Souza and Stahl's short video offered an overview of the conceptual premises and aims of their collaborative project, the Court of, for Intergenerational Climate Crimes. It asks, what does it mean to address a human, an animal, a tree or plant as comrade? For the court language, including the terminology of comradely political belonging, opens up new paradigms of relationality and commonality, surpassing the objectifying dimensions of property and proposing entire new juridical political frameworks for justice. As an entrance into their larger participatory project, the video lays the groundwork for the momentous socio-environmental transformation required of the work of aesthetics and politics today. Um, so the video I'll, I'll play right now is uh, 12 minutes long, and then we'll go into uh, a collective discussion. So um, here we go. What does it mean to address a human, an animal, a tree or a plant as comrade? For the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes, comradeship 
is a recognition of the relation between those on the same side of a struggle, a relation that is shaped by common work, common dependencies and common care. When a river brings life-sustaining water to people, plants and animals, is the river not working with all humans and non-humans in comradely ways? When a forest gives life-saving medicinal plants, when it provides home to the snake and the mongoose alike and holds back rainwater from flooding, does the forest not work with all in comradely ways? To harm Comrade River then, or Comrade Forest, means to harm the livelihood of all comrades, humans, animals, plants, fungi, protists and monorans that live in interdependency with that river or forest or with each other living by that river or forest. Not only those that exist in the present are harmed, but the unborn comrades of the future that are violently forced to live without river or forest. Comradeship is not given. Comradeship is a possibility that manifests through shared struggles by recognizing one another as fellow ecosystem workers. To use the noun comrade affirms a fundamental reality of collectivity, interdependency and intergenerationality. It affirms that across space and time, we must stand on the same side of the existential struggle between the death form of racial ecocidal capitalism and the living worlds needed for meaningful common survival. Comradeship is an affirmation of collective life in the face of extinction. What's wrong with rights? At least since the European Renaissance and the Reformation, European merchants, a section of the aristocracy and intellectuals, rallied together to bring about a social and intellectual revolution. They changed the concept of rights from an idea in moral philosophy in ancient Europe to a mercantile idea based on property and contracts. This new regime of rights was essential in the colonial period to turn land and living beings into commodities. This caused the first wave of mass extinctions, the extinctions of animal and plant life and of the human languages and cultures that thrived with them. Here, the death form of racial ecocidal capitalism manifests as the propagation of racial superiority legitimized as the right to dispossess living worlds. The proprietary idea of rights is necessary to enter into contracts. It has become so entrenched in our psyche and our modes of being in the world that we can no longer imagine a world without this foundation. From water, forests and land, from mineral to fossil memory, from labor to care and love, the proprietary conception of the world rules supreme. It does not matter whether rights-bearing parties appear in the form of the state or private individuals or corporations or NGOs or even rivers and mountains. Modern rights have transformed the merchant's worldview into the human worldview, a merchant's destiny into life's destiny. A rights-bearing river means that the law and not the river will decide how much water humans, birds, trees and mangroves must get. The relationship between the river and the lives that depend on it are no longer negotiated amongst themselves on the basis of interdependent needs, but instead are mediated 
by law and contractual obligations. The Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes recognizes nature as a relation that connects us to human and non-human ancestors of the past, to comrades in the present and to future descendants. It is those interdependent and intergenerational relationships that bind us together in our common struggle for a biosphere for all. We insist that land, water, forests can never be private property. We demand a new paradigm of climate justice that dismantles the idea of rights from property and contracts and anchors it instead to interdependent and intergenerational relationships between all living beings. We put the law on trial. We charge the law for establishing corporations and states. We charge the law for creating legal personhood for corporations and treating legal persons as if they were living beings. We charge the law for fraudulently claiming that transnational corporations like Airbus, ING and Unilever are persons comparable to human beings. We charge the law with permitting and encouraging murder of non-human life by limiting the crime of murder to human species alone. We charge the law with deceitful conduct by endowing transnational corporations with human rights, including rights to free speech and conscience. We charge the law with forcibly dismembering nature from people. We charge the law for fraudulently representing ecosystems as property and people as labor force and for allowing both to be bought and sold in markets around the world. We charge the law for establishing a social order founded on legal entities that can only survive by perpetually extracting life from the living worlds of peoples, cultures, rivers, mountains, forests, seas, animals, plants, minerals, fossils. We charge the law for the massacre of pasts, presents and deep futures by enabling the legalization of intergenerational climate crimes perpetuated by transnational corporations and states. We charge the law for co-constituting the death form of racial ecocidal capitalism. This is the court for intergenerational climate crimes. This is the court where pasts, presents and futures assemble. This is the court of human and non-human and other than human comradeship. Outside the court, non-human comrades are declared extinct plants and animals. Inside this court, they assemble as martyrs of the crimes perpetuated by states and transnational corporations. They are our ancestors who sit by our sides, comrades, with whom we hold hands, paws, leaves, as we charge the corporations and states responsible for the destruction of their worlds and ours. Fossils are present amongst us. For millions of years, our ancestors, animals and plants, lay buried in the recesses of time. Until modern states and corporations violently excavated and extracted them to burn our futures. This violence leaves generations of animals, plants, fungi, protists, and monorans without resting sites and without life-sustaining inheritances from their ancestors. Humans too assemble at the court. They gather to testify 
against corporations and states, against ecocidal and racialized crimes committed over multiple generations, against the death form of racial ecocidal capitalism. The humans join their comrades as judges, prosecutors, witnesses and jury to deliver justice to corporations and states for their intergenerational climate crimes. For numerous extinction wars against all species and against time itself. We future ancestors, we accuse, we bring evidence of what has been done and what is to be done. For that is the burning question of our movement in a burning world. We testify to violated pasts, presents and futures and we testify to defiant pasts, presents and futures. We bring evidence of dying worlds and of possible worlds. We testify not only to the violence that has been done to us, we bring evidence of the living worlds, the life forms, the forms of life that could be, that must be, that were and will be. In the presence of all human and non-human comrades gathered at the court for intergenerational climate crimes, we proclaim living worlds, interdependent rights, intergenerational solidarity. We proclaim that regeneration of all life forms is the first principle of a law that constitutes shared comradely ecosystems and must be respected unconditionally to ensure deep futures for all, intergenerational, interdependent, regenerational. Thank you so much um, for that video, uh, Jonas and Radha. Really an amazing uh, summation of the, of the very ambitious uh, paradigm shifting conceptual premise of, of the project uh, in demanding an end to the, what you call the death form of ecocidal capitalism and an entirely new legal and political paradigm uh, dedicated to intergenerational uh, interdependent uh, uh, solidarity. So I'm wondering like, just to kick us off, if you could talk a little bit about uh, the project, uh, now that you've had several days of witness testimony uh, against Unilever and ING and Airbus, um, I'm curious what remains for the rest of the project? How do you feel it's gone so far? Uh, what's your critical analysis of its accomplishments and remaining challenges? Maybe you could talk a little bit also about some of the, um, the testimony that's particularly struck you during the course of events. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jonas, you want to go? No, oh, please start. Okay. Um, there were a lot of questions there. Uh, and so what are the accomplishments? What did we try to do? What did we actually do? And so on. And uh, main takeaways from the hearings. I think... It is an ambitious project, TJ, as you said, by any measure. But I don't think when we got into it, we thought of it as an ambitious project. We just thought about it as, oh, this needs to be done. And uh, our objective was really to put something out there that would create a new conversation and that would open up people's minds to new ideas. And this is also largely because we found that people were really going around in circles. As I have said before, you know, when it comes to critique, we always put out amazing critique of what is wrong with things. But when it comes to solutions, we get back into the same kind of you know, uh, theoretical, conceptual uh, uh, traps 
and modes of thinking. And so we kind of wanted to break that. And that is why we, we did this in the way we did it. Did we actually break it? I mean, I think it wouldn't be completely uh, overstatement to say that people did find it refreshing. People did find that it, it generated new ways of thinking, which is exactly what we wanted. And uh, people were able to connect the intellectual arguments with their own emotions and feelings about the issue, which was something that we had hoped for, but didn't think would really happen because you know these arguments can be quite dense if you if you see what I mean. So, and that is why we wanted to present it in an art form so that it could be more accessible to people. So I think that clearly has happened. As far as the hearing goes, I think the hearing can be assessed in many different ways. One is, of course, it created a new conversation. The act itself created a new way of thinking about law, how law can be different and how it can be envisioned and visualized. It also brought together a whole uh, group of people, both within the Netherlands and outside, who were already engaged with these issues, but by bringing them together and by thinking through some of these things together, I think it did create a momentum. And uh, some of the uh, and I think most of the uh, uh, organizations that participated in giving the evidence, uh, you know, they also took away things from it for their own work in their own organizing. And that way also it has contributed. So, uh, I mean, that would be the major things for me. But uh, Jonas, you can pick up on things that I have left out or... Yeah, I think you, you mentioned already quite some important points. Uh, I think that the um, one one objective of the court, of course, is to is to assemble or well, partake to a larger ecology of um, of organizers, activists, of um, uh, progressive lawyers, uh, of cultural workers that have that are engaged in questions on of of uh, trying to bring about uh, alternative paradigms and putting to practice alternative paradigms of, of climate justice. So we consider there, there's no point in considering the court for intergenerational climate crimes as something that in and of itself changes anything. I think it's important to consider it as part of a larger uh, ecology that in, in the context of um, the current climate crisis ecosystem uh, collapse is seeking for modes of uh, meaningful common um, survival as we also try to, to narrate in the film. So the, the public jury that operated in the, the there are, there's no public in the court for intergenerational climate crimes, there's only a public jury. And these consisted of a really broad, of this broad uh, ecology of acti activists, people working in, in progressive law, uh, people, organizers in Extinction Rebellion, Code Red, which is a decolonial climate justice movement in the, in the Netherlands. Um, and I think acknowledging that intersection of this uh, particular uh, project that, that Rada and me worked on with these various simultaneous or organizing practices is really important. I think it was for me what surprised in a way surprised me from the four days of uh, public hearings against the Dutch state against ING Unilever and Airbus was that I realized the uh, additionally realized the importance of acknowledging um, loss uh, and deepening our understanding of crisis of course through Rada's work on uh, what's wrong with rights the book that the uh, you already mentioned TJ in the introduction. Um, we, we building on that work, we conceptualized the or acknowledged the climate crisis as a colonial crisis, as a as a as a crisis that have brought about various ends of the world and various uh, waves of extinctions from the colonial period through the industrial period to the present. And that's already, of course, a way of deepening and and complicating the notion of climate crisis. As something that is not inherited from a recent past and of course uh, adds to the challenging of the different time frames and skills of time that are operating in parallel in the uh, in the court um 
but 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 the 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 tragedy of course of of um, losing worlds uh, losing worlds of worlds going extinct is that maybe many people more people might have had this experience in the context of the pandemic that there is no time to grieve there is no time to acknowledge loss there's no time to honor our comrades and there's no time to build a memory uh, and i think this is this is one of the most maybe one of the most violent um consequences of uh, these centuries of extinction um, that that this time for grief this time to build a common genealogy to acknowledge our interdependent relationships within this genealogy that these are that these are lost so simply to make time to bear um, witness to testimony uh, of the various organizations that um, that showed the um, uh, international extractivist um, behaviors the extinction war that is waged by these corporations that we uh, called upon or called uh, called to trial in the public hearings just bearing witness to that i think has a, has a value in, in and of itself uh, and shows a, a political depth to the importance of of listening and witnessing and carrying this process of of witnessing and building memory um together that goes, of course, hand in hand with the alternative legal framework that the Rada draft, drafted for the CICC, the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act, and the fact that the court proposes a space to collectively embody that act when Rada calls as the lead judge on the public jury at the start of each of the public tribunals, tri uh, public hearings, she calls upon uh, the jury to consider the, uh, the evidence and witness testimony within that alternative frame framework and thus invites uh, invites us to collectively enact uh, an alternative paradigm of climate justice that is as possible as we are willing to carry it and um, make it actionable, bring it into into being. So I think for me the, the the importance of the of the court or the contribution that the court tries to do to this larger ecology of uh, of of organizers and activists and and progressive uh, lawyers is between these two this acknowledgement and deepening of loss and crisis and the collective embodiment and the kind of relentless insistence on uh, on collectively enacting what an alternative paradigm of intergenerational climate justice could or should look like thank you for that response um paulo susan feel free to jump in anytime I'm curious about um, the, um, the decision to focus the trial or the tribunal around um, the crime, uh, even while you have a, a really powerful critique of uh, rights. Um, and in recent years, there's been some progressive movement, at least um, I've thought of it as progressive in terms of moving toward, for instance, rights of nature. Uh, as a strategy to move away from the property basis of an anthropocentric focused legal paradigm. Uh, right, rights of nature, which is an international movement, has tried to forward rights of the more than human world in all sorts of interesting ways from, uh, from Ecuador and Venezuela, uh, Bolivia and Latin America to India, and even in municipal areas in, in the States. Um, clearly there's been some problem with um, actually realizing uh, and enforcing those rights. So maybe that's where we come into the critique of rights that Rada uh, has you know, so um, um, incisively brought into the uh, discussion. So I'm, I'm curious about the turn to crime. Doesn't crime in some ways, criminal, you know, thinking about criminology um, within the current juridical political order of racial colonial capitalism, um, it, could you maybe address how um, we're on the one hand asked to think very critically about rights, but then um, how crime itself might relate and uh, reinforce conditions of the state, even police, military, um, in a way reinforcing that same order that uh, you're otherwise trying to get away from with the critique of rights? I know that's a kind of a legal question, but I'm, I'm really interested in the move from say uh, the rights of nature type of discourse, which um, I acknowledge can be part of a, a liberal ruse in some ways toward um, thinking about intergenerational climate crimes. Like what is happening with that transition in, in your thinking? 
You know, I just uh, <coughs> excuse me add a part two to that question because the the question of crime then also invokes the specter of criminal law and its um, you know foundational principles around direct causality, which is the condition in in criminal law. So I, I, I if you could which has always hampered environmental justice, right? The burden of proving direct causality. It, this oil and gas company is responsible for the, 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 this ill health in a community when it's, uh, it's precisely the highly kind of dynamic, nonlinear systems of ecological systems that really defies that structural kind of uh, principle of direct causality, which is the cornerstone of criminal law. So crimes is also bound up with that particular body of, uh, of law. So that's part two to um, TJ's question. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you for those questions. I think uh, there are two parts to your question, TJ, if I've understood it correctly, and, and Susan, your addition to it. And that is, you know, one is the criminal law bit, you know, why criminal law? And the other is, of course, on the question of rights, you know, why, how is that connected and the transition, as you say. On the question of criminal law, and I, and Susan, this is absolutely what you said is how most people will see criminal law as something that in attributes individual responsibility to individuals, and there must be a direct connection between the criminal and the crime. And if you can't establish that, then there is no crime. And on both those, and they are very, very valid questions. First of all, I think we often forget a very, very basic fundamental principle on which our society is founded, yeah? or modern law, modern societies are founded. And that is the distinction that, that there is no distinction between what in legal terms is called a natural person and a legal person. So both are persons. And however, with a natural person, if a natural person commits murder, you can clearly establish, you know, was that person there? What was the evidence, et cetera? That connection can be made. But with legal persons, it becomes hugely complicated because it is not the CEO, it is not the manager who can take responsibility. So here you have a person who by definition, by its very nature is incapable of taking responsibility. And that is the foundation of our society. Same thing with states, it's a legal person. And that legal personhood means you can go after a civil servant, you can go after a policeman, but they are again, you know, on the one hand, conditioned to work, you know, in their, whatever the role that they are, they have been allocated within that organization. And, but then they can't take the responsibility for the entirety of the crime that is committed by the legal person. So we actually wanted to test that, that you know, falsehood, if you like, on which our societies rest. Now, here is a legal person. We put that legal person on trial. So this is one part of it. The other part of it is about criminal justice. Why did we bring in criminal justice into it? Now, this goes way beyond, you know, modern legal systems, but access to justice is a foundation of any legal system, yeah? that people should have access to justice. And then of course you can argue about whether something does give you access to justice, et cetera. But in the case of legal persons, what does justice mean? Because they define the terms of justice, they set the rules on what justice means or should mean, and then, you know, and where do we go? There is no court that you can take a corporation to or you can take a, a state to as legal persons. And there is no way of bringing them to justice. 
and we wanted to ex we wanted to highlight this reality that look hey look the kind of world that you live in yeah the worst perpetrators of injustices are above the law and beyond the law they write the law and they decide you know how it is to be enforced so this access to justice is key part of the criminal justice system and there is no access in this case when it comes to extinction of species a large scale dis uh, 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 destruction of environment livelihoods etc so if you kill one person you can you will could go to prison but you kill an entire region and the livelihoods of entire people or communities or cultures and ecosystems then that becomes development or progress or whatever you want to call it so i mean that that's the kind of thing that we wanted to put out there that's one part of it the other part of it is you know we wanted to rethink this whole idea of justice what does it mean what does justice mean you know when everything is lost when our futures are lost when our you know the environment in which we live is lost when our communities are lost when our languages and cultures are lost what does justice mean is it just enough to say i got compensation for the land that i was you know was taken from me by force and how many of us get those comp that compensation anyway so those were the kind of things and we felt that it is a crime to deny future generations of their right to exist and that is what is happening now future generations are being denied of even the right to be born let alone survive thereafter and so those kind of relationships we wanted to bring in coming to the question of rights why did we not go down the track of you know rights of rivers and rights of mountains etc i think most people i mean i know, i'm very aware of that discourse of of you know giving rights to nature and and all the rest of it now much of that comes from an understanding of what ought to be you know and this idea that law somehow gives justice and that if a river or if a mountain has justice somehow you know has has rights somehow justice will happen but look even human beings who have rights don't get justice so why, why do we think that that is one part of it why do we think that rivers will get justice that is one part of it the other part of it is that you know rights people have not thought about or, or when we think about rights of rivers etc we think about how can we safeguard rivers we don't think about whether the law is the right instrument to safeguard the rivers and in human history before modern law when people were didn't have all these rights and whatever the rivers were fine the forests were doing well under indigenous people yeah it's modern law and the extractive nature of the uh, development and that is what as the video says a merchant's world view becomes you know a human world view and that is what that is the problem and that is created by law that is not created by people abusing rivers or mountains there's only that much that an individual human being can do to you know harm a large river or a forest or whatever if there are deviant people that is so communities have always safeguarded nature and communities have understood the interdependent relationships it's modern law that takes from nature takes labor from people and uses it for you know a very mercantile purpose and the third thing i want to mention is the very grammar of rights is the grammar of contracts and i want to emphasize modern rights yeah it is a, it is no longer linked to ethics it's no longer linked to action it is a grammar of contract because every contract must have two parties you know a right bearing party and a party capable of tra transacting in those rights 
So somebody must have something to give and something to take. So this relationship and the very grammar of contract is what makes modern rights what it is. Yeah. And so supposing you give a river rights, to me as somebody coming from a long history of colonialism and that memory very much alive, if you like, you know, and formative uh, uh, for about, you know, in who we are and what we have become. This whole uh, language of rights for rivers reminds me of this discourse about rights for, you know, the natives, which was always seen as trusteeship. So the British were the trustees of their, you know, of these poor natives who could not look after themselves and therefore arrogated to themselves the right to be the trustee. What we are now doing is the same thing with the rivers. We are saying we will be the trustees because who's going to take them to court? Who's going to take, you know, somebody who, who destroys a forest or somebody who destroys a river to court? We will have to do it. So we are arrogating to ourselves. So on the one hand, we talk about the Anthropocene and all of that. On the other hand, we say, we want this right to be able to be the trustee of a river. And what we are saying is that is illogical. You cannot be a trustee of a river if you don't recognize that your lives have to be interdependent on the river for the river to be safe and for you to be safe, both. So it's a, it's a mutual relationship. So I think that is where the, the language, that the discourse of rights for nature misses the legal issues around it. It is framed largely on a philosophical or a theoretical or a, you know, a, a normative conception. So I'll just yeah, stop there. Well, there was a lot to discuss and to think about it. Um, it's kind of interesting. I, I work a lot with the question of non-human rights, as I call it, or rights of nature. And, you know, when some of those thoughts kind of emerge, or when they got, let's say, a kind of constitutional form, né, in the form of constituting a community beyond uh, the kind of colonial states that were left over in Latin America, there was a sense of um, revolution happening from the ground, from below, uh, allowing space for different types of cosmologies, precisely those who does not, do not recognize nature as a property, that do not recognize nature as a commodity, right? That is to say that are completely outside any parameter of modern law or positive law as such which uh, institution is, as, as Rada was mentioning, precisely to create commodities, right? And of course, uh, the very idea of enslaved people were very much sort of a product of modern law as well, uh, so on and so forth, that you could commodify not only nature, but also other humans in as much as they, was not, they were not considered humans as such, right? But animals. So there was a sense that, you know, one to... Uh, call somebody else a comrade was somehow organically related to this political movement that was opening up for different types of cosmologies. So I wonder how how you 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 understand that in relation to 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 a tribunal, uh, uh, which is in itself also a mechanism as the law itself. It's also a mechanism of if we're going to go to the colonial times of perpetrating violence, right? So how you know. There is a way in which um, I think that the idea of you know giving rights to other than humans were a way of appropriating, trying to navigate within, but also you know subverting the very means by which violence was perpetrated. And it seems to me that the court also operates in the same the same sort of uh, register. I don't know if you can speak a little bit about it. Yeah, I mean I see where you're coming from. And I am, uh, you know, I know that in Latin America, especially, there is a whole wave of what is called the new constitutionalism movement, you know, starting from Bolivia and now last in Chile, uh, you know, this idea of a new constitution, which is, you know, much more participatory, you know, all, all 
all those kind of things, in which nature again is has been a big subject of uh, discussion to different extent and different degrees. But I'll just make two points there. One is that the state itself is a legal artifact. So the constitution itself. And when the state is established as a legal person based on the constitution, it acquires a certain relationship to both the nature and the people living with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it is, so if you look at the institutional structure of, of these new constitutions, they are not very different from the old, you know, institutional aspects. So there has been no major institutional revolution or changes. What has changed is the normative side. Now the constitution does two things. One is it, it articulates what kind of nation and what kind of society you want to be. So that is always the opening state. We, the people, give unto ourselves, you know, what kind of society do you want to be? And the other part of it is it distributes power uh, to different branches of the state. And it, it sets out the rules and the terms on which power will be exercised. So, so far as the aspirational part is concerned, what kind of society do we want to be? Yes, we want our rivers to flourish, our natures to flourish. But when you come to the power distribution, the bureaucracy, the police, the state, the rights of communities, very little has changed to the best of my knowledge anyway. Yeah. And that is why Bolivia, which was initiated the new constitutionalism, has uh, got into a lot of difficulties because, uh, and that brings me to the second point, that when we speak about rights, we only speak about social and human rights, but there is also the economic rights, the rights of corporations, the rights of other legal entities. Yeah. And when we don't deal with those rights, then it completely flips you know, the meaning of what human or social or natural rights can be. And that is what happened in, you know, so many Latin American countries in Bolivia. Well, all the financial investors came after them and effectively staged a coup, you know, and, and this has happened in so many countries. And that is why I say that the grammar of rights is the problem. And if real power has to transfer to communities, then you wouldn't need a constitution like this. You know, this constitution form itself is a public law enactment that establishes the state, which of course has come through history and, and you know, whatever else. To your other point about whether our tribunal is not mimicking the same kind of structures. Yes, it is. And it is mimicking it because we live in those structures. But this is an art form that is using that, the form of our ex present system to challenge that very co in, in content. So the form is of a court, but what happens in the court is completely different. The way the court, the architecture of the court is completely different. The law that applies in that room is completely different. So we take that form and you say, in this form, you can put in completely radically new different content. Whereas in your real society, you can't do that. You can't do that because the law itself restricts you. You can't have a, a, an indigenous community saying, I'm fencing off this, this is our ancestral land. No corporations can come here. Nobody can come here. The state cannot tax us. They can't say that. Well. I mean, I, I do have some some examples where they actually have said, you know, in Ecuador, you have a case in the Inter-American Courts of Human Rights, and they successfully manage not only that the state should repair them, the state should say apologies in public. And, you know, this is another topic I'd like to discuss the question of reparation and how to conceive that. But they effectively manage to protect their territory from uh, any type of corporation entering their land. 
And now they are developing uh, a legal framework uh, as well, uh, which is called the Kausak Sacha Law, that they, in fact, two or three years ago have put forward uh, in the United Nations. That is to say, you know, understanding that there's something outside the bounds of modern thinking and including modern law that could somehow be used as an instrument in as much as you know the law is a means of power you can also sort of appropriate as a means of resistance right so it's not naive in any sense and it does produce in my view a certain type of real effect in the world and to that end, I think it's also important to acknowledge that popular tribunals have been uh, tactics of many different social movements in the environmental domain, including the rights of nature movement. So, you know, activists in Ecuador, in fact, even international activists associated with India, they were doing public tribunals and sort of, you know, performing or enacting a possibility of what this world could be uh, in what they call a political pedagogy that could reach a kind of, uh, you know, um, broader public. So, you know, even the form of art uh, can be appropriated. And in fact, it was led by those social movements that have been using public tribunals to enact their claims and to visibilize their claims so that the scholars and artists and, you know, many people around them could really understand what it's about. So I think there's a kind of genealogy or I would call it a jurisprudence that is important to be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. So you want me to respond to that or uh, was that just... Shall... No, it's just, uh, but uh, yeah, let's open the floor just not to manipulate the discussion. Can, can I follow up on a question then to Jonas, which is, I think it directly connects to the point you were, you're, make, you're making, Paolo, around um, forms of art and and doing politics. And it's, um, I remember well a conversation that we had at Kavaka where you, Jonas, were uh, saying, and I, I fully am convinced by the argument that, you know, art isn't particularly good. Art is very, no, art is very good at pointing out injustices in the world. It's That's something that it actually does quite well but it's never been particularly um or it's it's much more challenging for art to produce transformative kind of politics so art as as a kind of diagnostic of what is you know it can do that it can diagnose our our cultural social ills etc um, but it's much more difficult for art to intervene kind of politically and bring about kind of transformations and so um, I wanted to ask you um, whether that still uh, remains your conviction in light of a kind of project that you've done of this current uh, project, because at the time we were talking about the ways in which these parallel forums that, um, you know, that you've very, that's been very central to your, to your practice has, um, like, is a kind of paralegal structure that in some way sits outside of the other legal out, uh, out of official kind of legal sort of systems in order to critique that kind of system whereas i think paolo's talking about like a kind of like radicalization of the law from perhaps sort of from within or a kind of um uh doing the law uh you know like the sort of the sort of the ways in which certain kind of progressive or activists legal practitioners have um, worked with legal instruments for other sort of ends. So, yeah, if you could maybe um, you know, speak sort of directly to the kind of, um, yeah, the, the agency and capacity of art and whether that still remains the sort of, whether you would still um, make that same kind of uh, comment today. Well, I think art and cultural practice in, in, in liberal tradition indeed has this, um, has, has a, 
um, has has been <laughs> framed in our pop popular consciousness as that which um, holds mirrors, reflects back upon the world, highlights ambiguities, contradictions, but cannot uh, engage in a positionality or a relationality. So an artist working with a union, an artist working with a political party, an artist working within a social movement, that, uh, uh, that, that inherent positionality that comes with that type of practice is then suddenly considered in an entirely different vocabulary because then it's activism or it's propaganda, even, even worse. It is instrumental. So the, 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 the enduring myth of the, uh, the, the so this so-called critical capability or this capability of art to challenge, the, to reflect back, mirror the, the, the system, goes hand in hand with a detachment from the possibility of political transformation from actual transformative practice. Um, I think, and, and, but I think that that is not the only genealogy that exists. I think what uh, Paolo just referred to as the precedent that we're working on, the precedent that we inherit is a different genealogy that goes from the role of arts and cultural workers um, that, that were part of, of, of socialist movement, of anti-colonial movements, of civil rights movement, of black liberation movement, of feminist movement, of the ecological movement. And that is an entirely different art and history of art and cultural work that is inherently tied to uh, a, a different project for political transformation, trying to bring a, po a possible future into the present or building on uh, uh, alternatives of the past into the into the present in this intergenerational uh, sense, in which also the role of the artist or the designation even of an artist as individual um, offer is much more fluid and less defined and might not even be necessary to, because if in, in a revolutionary situation or in a situation in which we re redistribute the means of reclaim the means of of production, the means of world making of collective world making creative agency and creative capability and competences do not belong to a single to a single person but it's is, is inherently part of a, of a project of democratization um and for me that is that is a genealogy with which that informs my work and through which i hope to contribute with uh, with my work with rada and with uh, with other um, political organizations that i uh, that i that i work with and i think in that from and, and from that point of view i think it's also important to to acknowledge that the critique of right of of rights that that um that rada proposes and from which we build the court doesn't deny the importance of a um, multi-pronged strategy or struggle like um when when rada was in the courts she also had to ap appeal to human rights if necessary worst case scenario because that is the language that exists within that particular institution within that particular arena of um, struggle and that can produce real world effects within that particular arena of struggle. It doesn't, of course, um, uh, uh, negate the importance that we simultaneously challenge what are actually the foundations of this arena. Uh, who constitutes it? Who benefits from it on a structural uh, um, level? Um, but any means to uh, any 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 access point to minor or more structural forms of redistribution, um, I think are are valid. I mean, I work with with political parties that, and and I I have a hard time believing in the institution of the parliament. But I know it makes a difference when it's that party in coalition. When it comes to access to social security, when it comes to access to healthcare, when it comes to access to education, I know on the I know that on a I don't believe that on a structural long-term level, this is the work that can bring about fundamental transformation. I think on the long term it will be our demise. Um, but within the here and now, these struggles are important. It matters, and we've seen that also in the context of the of the pandemic. It matters whether Syriza, whether we had elected Syriza in the Greek government before the pandemic, or we didn't, and we didn't. And now we are three steps behind Hungary and Poland in the structural undermining the independent judiciary, the monopolization of the of the media, the, the criminalization of, of activists and journalists. Uh, so so I'm I'm very aware and uh, want to be also acknowledging of um, the importance of that multi and extra institutional work as something that belongs to a shared uh, ecology of uh, of world making practice. Yeah, just to elaborate on that a little bit more, um, I just wanted to point out and make it a little more explicit the fact that we're 
we have a, a range of really fascinating projects uh, under discussion here. There's there's uh, Jonas and Rada's uh, project on the international the intergenerational court on climate crimes, which is one approach uh, to putting law on trial itself, um, beginning with a critique of the property based mercantilist logic of uh, of rights under racial and colonial capitalism. Uh, and then Paulo Tavares has been involved in previous projects, including um, uh, forest law, which uh, investigated um, the, the, the way rights of nature were being mobilized within the Ecuadorian Amazon uh, from an indigenous perspective, specifically you know, from that of the Seriaku and, and Shar um, and, and other uh, indigenous peoples within that area as a kind of complex mechanism to do what they could to stop uh, neo-extractivism in the Ecuadorian context, even though they, uh, and I re recall this from the video, Paulo, um, as part of your research project, there was a, a, a distinct sense among indigenous activists that they knew that this, you know, they were dealing with the, the legal system and that was a, in some ways a double-edged sword, and a real complex situation, not something that they were going into naively at all. Um, and then there's, and then Susan's work with forensic architecture is yet another approach to um, the way in which uh, thinking about uh, forensic evidence, testimonial justice, um, and creating um, uh, uh, judiciable, um, judicial um, uh, cases within courts of law can bring about political transformation, but also recognizing the necessity of uh, the inadequacy of present legal forums uh, as they exist. Um, so there's the the need that's articulated, at least for, I see it within forensic architecture, that we have to think about inventing altogether new forums. So I think this is really a fascinating conversation that that is bringing together lots of different possibilities. And I think Jonas, what you were just saying, in terms of uh, this isn't about having to choose one um, and simplistically forwarding uh, like uh, just one exclusive approach to these conditions, but rather thinking situationally and contextually uh, in terms of what works and what forwards the progressive momentum in this or that context. Uh, but I, I think it's just a, a really fascinating case uh, or rather conversation that we're having. Um, one, one question I wanted to follow up on um, Kind of continues Susan's line of questioning, which is, you know, to bring it back to the to the court. Um, um, I think it's interesting to to think about the new kind of aesthetic uh, um, uh, uh, construction that the court is attempting to forward in relationship to creating spaces of, of comradeship, and specifically to to reinvent the possibilities of what artistic practice can mean in terms of the, um, you know, the or artist as organizer or the, the um, someone who is uh, at once creating forms of uh, radical political speculation, but also doing so, as Jonas, you've said, in relation to organizers and propagators, agitators and uh, mobilizers, and most of all comrades in social movements and emancipatory political organizations. This seems to be really crucial to mark um, the, the transformation that this practice, as well as that of uh, Paolo and Susan also are trying to carry forward, which is to really uh, reinvent the conditions of uh, the artist as a participant with so within social movement struggles. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about how you see the court, like how is the court pushing that further uh, within the, the wider framework of, of your practice and also Rada's practice? I mean, Rada, you've also been very much involved with, with various people's tribunals. It would be interesting to, to, to hear from that perspective as well, um, because yeah. that's also a genealogy you bring into the courts for intergenerational climate crimes. Yeah, I think the way this pushes, I mean, I've, as Yona said, I've been involved in many people's tribunals and I have, uh, you know, uh, known for for you know the the role and the and it's very useful and it has absolutely played major role in pushing various movements and demands and etc cetera, etc cetera. but uh, i think the difference in this case is the law the statute that is drafted that basically reconceptualizes what another kind of society that is 
ecologically consistent and coherent might look like. Now, that is something that existing tribunals or people's tribunals can't do because the remit of a people's tribunal is essentially to show that, you know, uh, is to take the law as it is and then to show how it could be interpreted differently or to show what the shortcomings of that law is. Yeah. But what we are trying to do is in this, the, what the statute tries to do is, look, if you really want an ecologically sustainable society, if you want a society that is intergenerational, interdependent, regenerational, etc., the social organization and the legal organization of that society has to be different. You cannot take the same law and try to create another society. You cannot take the same architecture of law and then create another kind of society. So what we do is we say, okay, if this is the law, as the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act says, then you can, this, this is how your society will look like. This is how power will be exercised. This is how relationships with nature will be built. Because if you start from the premise that uh, nature and human beings have a relationship and that relationship has been abused because of the intervention of modern laws, corporations, states, whatever. So if you have to end that abusive relationship and make that a healthy relationship again, then this is the kind of relationship, this is the kind of situation you need to be in to be able to heal that and to be able to rebuild that relationship. So I think that in that sense, the act and the premise of the court is something that is, I would say, radically different from, say, other tribunals or movements. And as Yona said, this does not mean that those other people's tribunals are not worthless. This is not about uh, you know, either this or that thing. This is an art project. That is a real community mobilizing project. That is why we did people's tribunals. We did the Tamil tribunals because there was a genocide of the Tamils, which we wanted to expose and to say how it was not. We had a, you know, various, we had a tribunal on, uh, you know, union carbide uh, gas, um, uh, you know, uh, exposure that happened because that was, we wanted to mobilize people, you know, to bring union carbide to justice. And, and, and whoever, Anderson, the CEO at that time, and so on. So that is a mobilizing act. This is an act that is that supports that mobilizing act, if you like, or aids that process by helping us to widen our imaginaries, by helping us to broaden, you know, our deepen our understanding, widen our horizons, so that we don't constantly get disappointed. Because with a lot of movements, they go up to a point and they get disappointed because you're back in that same you know, conceptual circuit or... or... So here we, we are trying to broaden the philosophical understanding so that movements can push further and not get disappointed when they hit a block because then they will know that you know this is why there is a, there is a, this is where the main stumbling block is, if you like. And I think also it's important that the, the direct link with the, with the case is that, that uh, Radas, sorry, the, the, the direct link with um, other people's tribunals and existing uh, uh, court cases that are, are currently running is that Radas research team consisted and, and the network of witnesses and prosecutors are all implicated directly in the research of multinational uh, corporations it's the the somo organization the kenya land alliance as in this they, they are part of uh, we are part of that larger ecology and they partook to in the context of the of the court for intergenerational uh, climate crime so uh, these various vocabularies tools and forms of action also assemble in the court as much as the court uh, attempts the court for intergenerational climate crimes attempts to contribute to to their work and, and, and struggle uh, on a very practical form, for example, by uh, the fact that the Radas research team was able to 
commissioned the evidentiary videos that that were shown in the court as part of our proceedings, um, but that simultaneously were um, uh, are part of the witnesses' own political campaigns uh, uh, function as evidence within uh, traditional uh, court cases that they are partaking in. So there's a that's also what I meant to say with with the the larger ecology in which the the court uh, tries to uh, tries to operate. But I think that what what Rada mentions this difference between the a mobilizing capability and an affirmative capability is is quite important. That the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes claims the claims a, a kind of relentless space for an affirmative for a collective affirmation of what it is that we desire um, without allowing ourselves not to um, uh, compute or let's say use the grammar to voc to uh, vocalize the desire through the institutions that are despite the fact that of course in this attempt of uh, this 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 work in other than statecraft you could say uh, we are still as uh, both uh, paulo and susan pointed out earlier we are still using some concepts that are associated with present day institutions and that is of course part of the the hijacking process of moving agency from one institution to the other, how much of an existing institution do people still need to recognize to be able to put their trust and their commitment and their collective work in the court for intergenerational climate crimes and not the International Criminal Court in uh, the People's Parliament instead of the State Parliament, like the, the use or the hijacking of these languages and concepts just enough in order for for, for to uh, uh, enable and direct identification. Um, but without reproducing the structures and, and mechanisms of power that we associate with them. I think that this, this is the, the practice or the language of, of other than um, statecraft. Yeah, well, there's a lot to talk about. We don't have much time yet uh, still, but uh, I have two questions which are going to shift a little bit the conversation, but I think it's uh, interesting to to discuss or maybe just to to make those questions and we can discuss this, this later on one 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 aspect of the climate co collective and the discussions that we have been having we you know with different participants and and people that we invited to discuss is this idea that um any type of future uh uh sustainable future uh that is going to say heal the earth or that's going to amend the crisis that's going to produce any sort of meaningful effect and bring the world to balance again in balance again requires a certain form of reparation uh in relation to past wrongs that have been committed to those communities uh whose rights have been violated and of course when we speak of communities here we are also thinking about a community beyond the human right so um, somehow the, the idea of justice, also intergenerational justice, and by meaning intergenerational, we are not only, let's say, referring to this idea of a future sustainability, but we are also, as you mentioned in your project, referring to our ancestors and the pasts, right? Because the crimes committed in the past, they still ongoing in the future, as we could see uh, with the anti-racist uh, protests that have been happening around the world. So I wonder if you could, uh, uh, and, and, and Rada mentioned this idea of, you know, compensation, that's usually the way to redress those types of crimes. And there's a lot of discussions about what would be a form of reparation in terms of the environment. So I wonder uh, uh, if you have, if you guys have crossed this, these ideas or what justice would look like uh, uh, if enforced uh, upon those criminals. Uh, and the other question that I have, but maybe that's too much, is the idea that we know that the establishment of uh, uh, a criminal international a court, criminal court, has been, in fact, another way of the powers that be to exercise their right to intervene in other countries, uh, as well as, you know, focusing the persecution uh, only on the leaders of the global south, whereas, you know, the war criminals there were criminals of the global north remain without any accountability. Uh, and in proposing uh, international climate crime courts, um, isn't this a way of, you know, uh, let's say coming top down uh, 
uh, uh, uh, towards, uh, let's say, some other forms of, of uh, uh, um, let's say, political legal activism that, ha that, have, that are already happening. I wonder if you have discussed about this potential, let's say, threat. We know that the United Nations eventually is going to create, together with the Blue Helmets, uh, a military force called the Green Helmets in order to avoid, you know, climate crisis encounters that are going to be punished more for the global clim climate crisis. So we are seeing a kind of militarization or human rightsization of the question of ecocide and of the question of, you know, climate crisis that are going to open up new ways of intervening. And of course, in this military apparatus, an international court would be instrumental. I wonder if that reflection in terms of the role, the actually the very pragmatic role that the International Court has taken in terms of its new imperial role uh, uh, after the 90s. Mm -hmm. mm. So as I understood it, I mean, you're asking about the question of reparation that is one part of it. And the other one is about, you know, the increasing securitization and militarization of, you know, uh, the global South in new ways. So first it was humanitarian intervention, which became a way of, you know, deterrent strikes and whatever. Then it was sanctions, and you know now there is, and now is the green helmets. So it's another layer to this whole thing, and that is clearly true. I mean that is why you know there is need to completely um, minimize or to push back as much as we can, and in whatever way we can. Uh, so you know, and that is clearly a, 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 an issue, and any intervention from the top, we already have too much and I don't think we need any new intervention and this has been going on for a long time. As far as the reparation question is concerned, for me coming from as a lawyer, you know, both a practicing lawyer, an activist lawyer and a legal academic, I would say that is more like catching a tiger by its tail because you leave this corporate person, this huge tiger alone, they got plenty of money. So don't worry about money. They can give you plenty of money. And the reality is there are certain things that cannot be compensated. You know, we cannot bring our tigers back. We cannot bring, you know, our dried rivers. Well, maybe we can, but it's going to be a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, so there are some things that the whales cannot be brought back because they're gone, they're gone, you know. So this is the reality. So that cannot be compensated. And the people you are asking compensation from for them, it means nothing. Because by the time a small group goes to court, whatever wins, you know, you look at Shell, they will, they will pay that. But the main thing is not that. The main thing is we want to stop this now. Stopping further destruction should be top priority. And then we can only then we can talk about regeneration. And when it comes to stopping, if the corporate structures are going to be there, if there is no movement against the corporate legitimacy of their existence, and if your entire legal system, your state system, everything is going to be around, you know, this interdependency of states and corporations. That is the interdependency that we need to focus on. So I'm just wondering how does, you know, asking for uh, a compensation or, you know, uh, how does that actually solve that problem? So even if you get reparation, let us say, then, but the corporations will continue in other ways and new ways. And so, you know, if you are not con challenging that structure, if you are not challenging the very fact that these legal persons are not persons, they are not like you and me. If you don't challenge that basic, then this will continue. You know, so this will continue. You look at slavery, for example. Okay, now Britain will say, oh, we abolished slavery. 
of course they, they you know the the uh, first of all you know it was the haitian rebellion that really raised the slavery question but let's let's leave that aside for a moment you know but then what did britain do it abolished slavery and then it introduced indentured labor and then what did you have what happened after world war ii indentured labor was abolished and then all the sweatshops came in in the name of development but you know so it continues in new forms but the old things continue and so that is why i think we need to go to the root of the matter and the root of the matter is these social institutions which are by their very nature you know uh, uh, expropriating appropriating and they must do that to survive if corporations don't start taking oil from the ground and forests and things they can't they can't continue whereas you and i will continue and we'll probably live better off than what we are doing now so you know i mean that is that is why i say it's like catching the tiger by its tail yeah we had an interesting yeah. conversation sorry yonas um do you want to go ahead No, I just want to say I, I I I recognize very strongly what Rada says when it comes to this question of reparation. That it's such an important term when we speak about the ecological or colonial reparation, and at the same time, it's such a such a um, um, it's such a tricky term because indeed it it doesn't it doesn't recognize the worlds um, lost. Um, it, it it evokes, I think, the the. A possibility of justice, but of course, what what we face is is its absence. Um, and when we say martyrs never die, um, I I think we on one hand acknowledge the fact that there is no just justice for the martyrs that died. There is no compensation. There is no reparation. But there is a struggle we inherit, and it's a struggle for the possibility of justice. Um, and, and and maybe that's that's how how I would. Take on the 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 notion of uh, of repair. When it comes to to the to the to the question of scale and 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 the, the the reference to the to the international courts and obviously our court references in its name CICC the ICC the International Criminal Court that claims a um, uh, a a a role as neutral arbiter to um, uh, impose um, its um, its sanctions and decisions on everything except for itself. Our choice as the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes to only prosecute uh, uh, transnational corporations uh, enabled by the Dutch state registered in the Netherlands uh, was a direct response to uh, to that to the to the modus operandi of the of the ICC. Uh, simultaneously, it also acknowledges acknowledges the reality of a somewhere else here, in the sense that these corporations might be registered in the Netherlands, but it's obviously not. Not where they extract their capital from, and it's uh, that it's only the place where it, where it uses the benefit the, the, the benefits of a particular legal infrastructure, uh, or and, and a tax and a particular uh, enabling tax a corrupt tax uh, tax regime. But its reality manifests through our witnesses from uh, Indonesia to to Kenya to um, to to Mongolia. Um, in, maybe the term international is not 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 the not the crucial one here, but um, something of a planetary paradigm or the opening up of a planetary paradigm that recognizes uh, uh, or that that situates itself um, radically in a place that has or builds on a place based understanding of the world, but understands that that place is always part of a somewhere else here seems essential, but it's. Um, um, I think this is a continuous tension that we are that we are uh, confronting in our practice. That this this um, the importance of hyper locality and the fact that this cannot um, and ne negate the in, the larger interdependency, that the larger planetary interdependencies that we are part of, and the fact that our opponents or our enemies act at that scale. I mean, the history of internationalism, of progressive internationalism or revolutionary internationalism, was of course. Not didn't came about as a desire simply to be international, but to be able to act on the scale of the violence and forms of oppression and expropriation that were acted upon us. Um, so it, it was in some sense an, an example. Internationalism is in some sense an example of an other than statecraft at the planetary scale that came from the necessity to respond at the 
at, at the scale at which we are, which, which we experience in a particular aggression. And Paul, if I can just, you know, add one more thing to your question about uh, reparation, you know, can there really be reparation without repentance? Because, you know, and that is the crucial question, isn't it? Because uh, who's going to repent? A legal institute person? So, you know, the whole concept of crime and punishment involves and the, involves a certain you know uh, ethic capacity to be ethical so then the question of whether you are or not comes in but these are legal constructs these are legal artifacts and the, the very fact that we expect them to be you know conscientious or repent or anything is in, in itself a problem Anyway, um, just thought I'd throw that in. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think we could we could also bring in Moten and Harney's productive or, or affirmative notion of debt in and the ways in which Denise Ferrar de Silva talks about the, the debt that can never be paid, right? There is no monetary um, equivalence to the history of genocidal violence that swept through the Americas. That's a debt that can never, it's not, it's not a number that could be arrived at, and it's a debt that ne could never be paid. Um, and therefore, we'd have to think about a completely different kind of conception of what reparations might be it, in recognition of the impossibility of a sum. And so therefore, what? how do we reformulate a notion of reparations that is just has the same sort of imaginative force, I guess, would be the the question. Mm. Yeah, I think this came up in our discussion uh, with the Climate Collective with uh, Oluwemi Taiwo, uh, the the African American Nigerian philosopher who talked about uh, rep, rep, reparatory futures very much in in that complex light, less about coming up with a monetary payment to pay a debt, uh, but rather recognizing an un the unpayable debt, uh, the, the urgency of stopping harm immediately and building, thinking of uh, reparations as building uh, new kinds of futures uh, together on the basis of say relationality um, or accountability and responsibility. So uh, we had a really uh, productive discussion with him. I think that this comes back to um, so if you're listening to this, check out that other conversation. Otherwise, Susan, did you, did you want to raise that other question about rights and demands? If I can just, just uh, well, say a sentence there, throw in a sentence there, TJ, that the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act just does just that. It makes, it provides penalties. And the penalty is that you go to a place, you commit yourself to a place, and you live there, and you build something new after and expropriation and after trans and transfer of ownership <laughs> of of the corporations yes it was a it was a it was a point of contestation between rada and me wh whether the notion of punishment should remain part of it which was probably my own revengeful uh, nature um but i think we settled on expropriation and and um um and re-education on communities terms. Yeah, the question that TJ and I are alluding to, it comes out of the end of your book, Rada, the postscript, and it was the sort of like the state, you know, saying that the distinction between rights and demands that is made, of the, um, so not the right to food, but food, not the right to self-determination, but a demand for self-determination. And and T, this is a, we were having this discussion uh, last week, Paolo, in, in thinking about this evening, and, and that we, that was a, it, we, it was a very kind of provocative kind of distinction that you make, Rada, and uh, I think I would really, well, we'd really welcome some further kind of um, insight and in, in reflection on 
just how that operates because uh, when can I, I can sort of see how like and maybe and TJ will feel free to jump in because it was the it's like the kind of just the force of the demand is really I think is extremely kind of politically important but somehow the right um, is also a recognition of the uh, necessity for those kinds of provisions where the demands can completely go unheeded, but certain rights then become kind of, I suppose, it's norms, right? Mm. So the, well, the yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll tell you how I came to that. I arrived at that point, you know, and that statement. Because one thing is working with social movements what became apparent to me at least is most of the time when people ask for rights you know they are actually demanding something uh, you know like i remember we had this lockout in a tea plantation in india you know and then you know uh, and here there were the because the tea, uh, tea plantation workers live on the plantation so when there is a lockout, the, the workers are out and they have no home to live in and they have no rations because it's the employer that gives them the rations. And so they were you know, asking for right to uh, food. And I said, you know, and I was thinking, is it right? Is it the right to food that we want through legislation? And by doing that, is this plantation owner actually going to give them that food. And also there is a public uh, distress laws that if people don't have food, then they could have, you know, that the government has to do something to give that. So the local administration did have the powers to give rations to those people. I mean, this is an example, but what they were actually saying is that they want food, but it was articulated in the language of rights. So this is, and I think this happens across the spectrum with a lot of social movements. When they actually say, we want rights to rivers, what they want is the river to be okay and healthy and not polluted and not abused. That's what they want, but there is no other language. So we have come to a situation where there is no political language to articulate what we want, except in the language of liberalism. That was one point. The other thing is, I also started to worry about when, you know, all the world banks and the IMFs and all started, uh, you know, advocating rights. And then I had to think, why, why are these, why, you know, I can understand why those workers who were thrown out of their plantations want rights to food. But why are, is the World Bank want rights, you know? And in the World Bank's case, it was a complete somersault. Because earlier they were saying, you know, rights have nothing to do with us. We are an economic organization. We only lend money. That's our job. And then they did a complete somersault. So I was forced to think about what is entailed in that somersault. And then, of course, when they came up with the global governance thing, the whole and what, what in UN speak is called mainstreaming human rights. And when that mainstreaming started, it was very clear. There was a match between the demands that people were making and the way those demands were getting incorporated into the same you know, legal and international institutions and mechanisms. And so people were getting frustrated. And as someone who has been very much part of the anti-globalization movements, we used to come a full circle on this. You know, There were two camps, the fix-it camp and the nix-it camp. And this fix it and nix it arguments just went on. And I had to say, we need to think about why is it that we are always arguing about whether we should fix it or nix it. And so that is how I came to that, that thing. And as to your question about when you demand something, you know, you don't really, it, nobody hears, listens to it or hears it. That is yes and no, it depends on whether you are demanding something from an authority, expecting them to, to uh, you know, uh, concede to your demands, 
or whether you are demanding it as a matter of your self-determination. Take the anti-colonial movements, you know, people demanded independence, not because Britain was going to say, okay, we set all the colonies free, but because that is how we mobilize people to say, we don't want to be a slave nation. We want to be an independent nation. And, uh, you know, and there were all kinds of arguments about it, but people, that was a demand. So it was not asking for right to self-determination. It was saying, we have the self-determination and we are going to take it. So this food is produced by us. It is our food and we are going to take it. So we are demanding that. If you don't give it, we will have to find ways of making sure how we feed ourselves. This is a fundamental you know, existential question for people. So that is why I was, you know, and the rights thing is complicating this and confusing people. And I thought that it will bring much more clarity to social movements for whom I wrote this book to say, we demand this, we want this. So either we sit and talk like sensible adults or we take it. One last thought I had, um, which could be a kind of speculative question, is um, you know, in terms of this question of demands, thinking about demands rather than rights. Um, uh, another theory of change which we haven't really talked about is uh, what happens within labor movements when demands are made. Um, demands are premised on a potential strike or a withdrawal of labor. Uh, and that's another way to forward political or economic change. And I'm wondering in, in some ways, thinking about the more than human realm as comrades, comrades being the language of political uh, solidarity and, and relationality, uh, whether we're not living through a time right now when, when we're witnessing a kind of more than human strike um, that's catastrophic and tragic, but involves the withdrawal of participation and labor in relationship to the reproduction of uh, life as we know it. Um, I'm just wondering if what you think about that is, is you know, is ecocide a kind of strike of the more than human realm? Um, it's completely speculative question, but um, in a way I'm thinking about how demands are made with the more than human world. Like when a river strikes, it stops running, it dries up. Uh, when a forest strikes, it ceases to reproduce um, the, the necessary requirements to sustain uh, multi-species life. Uh, maybe that's another way to understand what's going on today in the more than human realm is a kind of um, a kind of uh, um, tragic and um, potentially uh, irreversible strike. Mm -hmm. You want to go, Jonas, or I'm thinking. I'm thinking through the. I'm thinking through the proposition there because it's 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 um um I'm. I'm it's a very interesting question because it's a it's a very interesting proposition because of course it it challenges um, through through which uh, linguistic categories uh, can we affirm our interdependency with fellow ecosystem workers um, without um, claiming what sort of intelligence defines their uh, individual and collective actions in the sense of when I recognize someone as a comrade, I do not make assumptions about the uh, intelligences or um, forms of consciousness or uh, other ways that um, uh, whatever it is that mobilizes one to act in one way or another. Um, I recognize primarily our interdependency as fellow ecosystem workers. When we say strike, we suppose a particular form of um, a particular idea of intelligence or consciability, of which I am not, while an extremely enticing pro proposition to understand or grasp something of the, 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 the strike that, that makes us demand oxygen for all. Um, I am wondering whether that is also whether that doesn't inscribe um, whether that doesn't in, inscribe um, a, a particular idea of consciousness whereas the challenge is maybe to res respect intelligence how they work without 
naming what that intelligence is. I, I have a little bit of trouble to respond very directly because it's a very provocative, a very provocative proposal. But I think it has to do with, um, uh, with, with um, um, trying to avoid a kind of anthropomorphic relationship mm -hmm. to uh, non-human comrades. Right. Yes. So, sorry, just just jump, jump in. There's something I think it it's what's in. Oh, I find interesting is the va the valence in that question in relationship to work. Right. It's not maybe don't think like what is the you know the work of a root system of of a forest or um, you know uh, atmospheric conditions etc. It 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 works in the service of maintaining various sort of equilibriums or the work of wind uh, to, you know, to distribute seeds, etc. And I think that the, uh, that aspect is often not discussed, right? When we talk about extinction or species decline is, is the kind of like the productive value that all of these entities working together are actually producing and, and to sort of what would it mean to think take to think about those kinds of entities from the paradigm of labor is I think is it it's interesting because of course that's actually what's operating it's it's a kind of work uh, you know collective workforce in fact right but yeah. I think the, the question of yeah. whether we use the term strike depends on whether we are evaluating uh, whether we recognize um, um, uh, uh, non-human comrades um, as workers or as laborers. And I think that, 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 that somehow makes the difference. So what is, what is strong about the strike, strike proposition is that it immediately acknowledges a particular agency, but potentially the risk is that, it, that, it's, that it's an agency that is specifically tied to organized labor, to the history of organized labor. Uh, whereas in this case, we might have to think exactly as you were saying, uh, as you were saying, Susan, to an expanded notion of work in which the notion of organizing or the concept of labor has an entirely or maybe it has, might potentially have no relationship at all. This is, uh, yeah, this I think is where the, this is what the, that's what this provocation brings about as a, as a next question. No, I think there is also a, a, a more philosophical question that underpins that that we need to think about you know that underpins this and in the interdependence yes you know we appropriate nature but nature reappropriates us so if you don't you know live sensibly in a good relationship then then what you get is dried up rivers and you know melting snows and whatever it is and that makes conditions for our lives you know, uh, un, not un, unviable. But I think it is important to bear in mind in that relationship between nature and human beings that human life is unconditionally dependent on nature, that there is no human life. To stand, we need a ground to stand on. There is no human life without nature. But nature is not dependent on human beings. Nature can continue without us. If, I mean, you imagine if there is a nuclear holocaust or the nuclear winter sets in or whatever it is that happens, the chemical reactions will continue, whatever new forms of evolution will continue. Nature does not need us. We need nature. And it is that humility that we have lost. And it is that humility that we need to bring in. And legal persons can never have that humility. And that is why we need to take back control of our relationship with our nature, recognizing that our lives unilaterally depend on it. And to remove all the other kind of institutional interventions that is stopping us from claiming it and from you know, rebuilding it and, and, and reestablishing that relationship. Thank you, Radha. Um, that might be a good point to, to bring it to, to an end, unless uh, Paolo or Susan, do you have any last questions? Um, or uh, Jonas, any last thoughts or should we call it there? I will still 
pondering what it means that if when we call dying a, uh, a strike, like can 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 unchosen death be be a, be a strike or or, um, or 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 do we need another another, another vocabulary for it? Like, does it does it in, does does uh, if we if we speak of a of a strike of eco of non human ecosystem of non human ecosystem workers, then um, then we we suggest or that suggests conscionable death as a, as a protest. Whereas I have always understood the strike as a demand for life. Mm -hmm. I don't have an it's not I don't have an answer to this question, but the, the, maybe it was the last. And this probably is something you should cut out entirely from this conversation. But it was I was still thinking through the uh, the consequences of this proposal. Yeah, I I don't have a, a response myself um, other than to to recognize the necessity. Maybe if we're going to address the question of um, uh, somehow deanthropocentrizing the notion of strike itself and can that be done or is it a strategic anthropomorphism that can operate against anthropocentrism i, I don't know <clears throat> but um, maybe something for another conversation but um thank you so much uh, Jonas and rada it's been amazing i've learned so much uh so much to think with um and the project is, has just been really generative and thought provoking and i think politicizing in in ways that we deeply need so thank you so much for your uh for your uh, joining us in this conversation today thank you very much it was a pleasure thank you yeah. so much Rada and Jonas. it was fun a really fantastic yeah. Uh, evening yeah thank you it was a great thank pleasure you. i i also did feel that there was a an, under, an underlying other conversation that we could also have had which which would have to do with this notion of other than uh, statecraft through like uh uh, your DJ's alternative uh, uh, cultural genealogies moving through different uh, protests and popular popular movements through uh, forest law as a also a way of hijacking repurposing existing constitutions in a way transforming them to social contracts or recognizing the social contract lingering under the capture yeah. of the constitution and Susan's I mean I remember Susan's uh, meeting when we were in The Hague that it your your work really changed for me a lot of understandings of what is evidence and what are the performativities of uh, uh, of evidence and also the forensics works when i saw the um, the presentations of the works in uh, in Athens on the murder of uh, uh, Zak and uh, of Kilapi i mean you should have seen this, the, the the space where it was presented that was a, that was a people's tribunal i mean i know that that material is also used in existing court cases but presenting it in the context of Athens all of the activists and organizers that came to see their forensics i mean that was that was a people's tribunal in every sense of the every sense of the word or people's court so um but maybe that's for another that, that's for another uh, for another conversation yeah it should be continued for that sure we continue you guys it was yeah. wonderful